Thanks, JR. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Amy Caraba Salazar. I'm the CEO and president of the St. Helena Chamber of Commerce. And welcome to Conversation, Conversation excuse me, in Leadership Part 3. This is our third part of our series. And we're just, um, we've had such a great turnout. We're so happy to have everyone there joining us. And today we've got a great panel of speakers uh, really talking about a, a lot of great things in leadership. So with for, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the Chamber's new Vice President, Stephanie Ikabachi, and have her take it away. Stephanie. Good afternoon. Thank you. So uh, this workshop series organized um, through the St. Helena Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Joaquin Raza, who took the lead on this project and Pacific Union College. We are so grateful for our panelists to be here and provide these workshops and educational opportunities for our businesses and our community um, so we're just grateful. Joaquin is going to be our moderator for today's conversation. Joaquin has an extensive background working with nonprofits, organizational leadership. He just recently graduated with his master's in organizational behavior and leadership from Gonzaga University. So we've got an expert moderating our conversation and uh, asking our thoughtful leaders uh, some really excellent questions that are going to challenge you, I hope, um, and allow us a moment to learn from all of you and take uh, your words into our future. So, Joaquin, without further ado, thank you so much for being here and moderating the conversation today. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Amy. I'm so excited to be moderating this amazing panel on leadership and resilience, um, and especially as we talk about it in, you know, in conversation about Napa Valley and resilience with the Napa Valley and the different industries. Um, I'm gonna introduce our panelists real quick with a quick bio for each one um, so we can get to know them a little bit better. First, we have Dr. Robert Cushman. Dr. Cushman is a 23rd president of Pacific Union College. Most recently, Dr. Cushman held the position of vice president for academic administration at Walla Walla University in Washington. After serving as the professor of pa paleobiology and department chair in the Department of Biological Sciences at the university for four years. He has been a dedicated Adventist educator for more than 25 years, serving in a multitude of capacities. Dr. Cushman holds a PhD in geology from Colorado School mm -hmm. of Mines, a master's in geology from Loma Linda University, and a bachelor's in biology from Walla Walla College, now university. His commitment to collaborative efforts and willingness to partner with faculty, staff, and students, and the larger community makes him a strong addition and great addition to the college's already strong focal point of service. We have Dr. Stephen Herber. Dr. Herber is president and CEO of St. Helena Hospital. Dr. Herber is a, pre sorry, <laughs> president of St. Helena Hospital, also now known as Adventist Health St. Helena. Uh, Dr. Herber completed his plastic surgery training in 1992 at Yale University School of Medicine, where he was also a faculty member. He received his med medical degree and surgical residency training at Loma Linda University School of Medicine, where he later returned to teach in the Department of Surgery after completing a fellowship in pediatric reconstruction and maxiofacial surgery. I hope I said that right. As an active researcher, Dr. Herber contributed widely to medical journals, textbooks, and conferences, and appeared in media as an authority on a variety of reconstructive procedures. In 1998, he founded the St. Helena Institute for Plastic Surgery and has practiced in the Upper Valley for over 20 years. He accepted and executed the role, uh, a role at St. Helena Hospital in 2011 and became its president in 2014. We have Marcus Marquez with us as well. Marcus has a gift in bringing the right people together at the right time and infusing them with inspiration. This is especially key when it's time to build a team because he makes sure that everyone is regarded on the same level. Brought on as an opening partner and GM of the wildly popular Goose and Gander, Marcus developed and ran the swanky Up Valley hotspot. During that time, he strategized with friend Stacia Dowdell behind the scenes on a property that became known as what we know it as today as Brasswood Napa Valley. Marcus believes that we all have unique talents and gifts, and when aligned with a common goal, those talents unite like a symphony. This can be seen in his many community and business pursuits, an integral part of Napa Valley scene. 
He is a chair for the St. Helena Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors and on the board for St. Helena and Calistoga Boys and Girls Club. He's the author of first and second edition, 100 Things to Do in Napa Valley Before You Die, a project motivated by a love of the area and driven by a desire to inspire people to visit the beloved Napa Valley. And we also have Amy Krabba Salazar. Amy is a communications expert and award-winning journalist with deep experience in marketing and promoting local businesses. Currently, Amy is the CEO and president of St. Helena Chamber of Commerce. She worked in broadcasting as a television news anchor in some of the country's top markets for more than 12 years, including San Diego, Las Vegas, and Sacramento. Her role expanded outside of television studio after she was hired to help market and promote local businesses and area nonprofits. With that, she brings a well-rounded understanding of diverse community and businesses. Amy has been with the Chamber almost four years and is responsible for creative direction, brand management, digital campaign strategies, and successful marketing campaigns for the destination marketing efforts for the entire city of St. Helena, while also running the Chamber, promoting and supporting local business. She is a new mom and cancer survivor and uses her daily life experiences to lead the Chamber team. Wow, what a panel we have for you today, especially to talk about resilience. So I'm gonna ask all of you the first question, this lead question, what path did your career take that resulted in your current position? Um, and let's start with Amy. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks, Joaquin. <laughs> um, my path took a, quite a turn because I think when you when you're young and you're in college and you say, this is what I'm going to do for my career. I remember my grandfather saying, you know, you'll do more than one career in your life. And I remember thinking, no, he's crazy. I'm going to be a news anchor forever. And obviously that, that was not the case. Um, I loved working in television. I loved learning about how a job can change very quickly. Um, and when it transitioned to working with local businesses, it was just so interesting to find myself in a new role where I'm working with businesses and in a leadership position in, in that sense. And I think what makes that interesting is, is having somebody who's leading, adjusting to the times, adjusting to your role and really sort of for you as a leader, that helps you become the leader that you are because you are going through different careers. You are meeting different people. You're making different connections and that evolves yourself as a leader in whatever position you are um, moving forward. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Uh, Dr. Cushman. Thank you, Joaquin. So I have to admit when I was a college student, I never anticipated moving into college leadership roles. Uh, I started my career as a biologist and then moved into geology and anticipated spending my time uh, doing research or working in the petroleum industry. Uh, in fact, I began my career in the petroleum industry uh, before realizing that my heart was in education and then moving into a faculty position um, at Loma Linda University in Southern California in geology. So after serving in that role, I became a department chair there and then moved up in a fairly traditional uh, way moving from department level administration into then academic administration and finally here as president of BEC. So once I decided to make education my career, it, it was a fairly traditional path moving up through department chair and then academic administration, finally to president. That's wonderful. Uh, Dr. Herber. Well, I may add to this theme a little bit. If somebody asked me when I was doing my pre-medical studies at PUC, if I'd ever be a hospital administrator, I would have asked them what kind of pharmaceuticals they were indulging in because I, <laughs> I had no thought about that. I, I think, um, you know, I, I found that I loved caring for patients. And when we moved to the Napa Valley, I fell in love with the community, the place, the people. It was close to my alma mater of PUC, and I, I just loved the place. And I did my surgery at the hospital. And, you know, I think 
I think the key to having your life go a different direction than you anticipate is having an open mind and being willing to consider things when people ask you and saying yes, maybe more often than you're comfortable. Um, I was really surprised 10 years ago to be offered a position as a hospital administrator. And then that led to becoming president. But having um, an interest and a curiosity and leadership opportunities and taking those whenever they arose kind of brought me to this point. So that's how yeah. I got here. <laughs> Marcus. Well, I feel like I, um, I'm in the food and wine world. So how I got here is I've been eating and drinking my whole life and it just seemed natural, but, uh, it's kind of like what you said. I, um, and listening to Joaquin, the way you described me in the, in the intro, I always am fascinated on how people, uh, perceive what I do or who I am. And, uh, and you are correct. I have been known for putting the, the people together, connecting people, because one of the things that I feel that got me to where I am today is that I've always enjoyed watching people succeed or making people's dreams come true. I tell my friends, don't tell me what you want to do because I'll make it happen. And that's entrepreneurial spirit. And it's just one of those things that I think I got here to be in this position because I was always putting teams together that were passionate about what they did. That's awesome. And, you know, I think it's important to, to realize that that's such a community-based approach to leadership as well, which is important, especially in this conversation when we're talking about resilience. And the reason why we did this is because it's hard to find an in industry that didn't have to reinvent itself through the pandemic um, and be resilient through these efforts. So when we talk about that, um, I'd like to ask, um, and we'll start off with Marcus, actually, um, what did you wish you knew more earlier on in your career? Um, and is there any training or skills that you'd realize now that would have been helpful? I think to this question, I would look back and wish I would have understood what learning opportunities were from uh, experiences and being on the job training and taking those learning opportunities and making them growing opportunities. So. I guess I would, as a young person in the industry, is really understanding when there's a learning opportunity for a positive or negative behavior that you are able to retain that information. And then the skill that, uh, what was the question, the skill that I realized? Yeah, any training or skills that you wish you'd have had or known before that you should have really grasped onto even? Um, I don't know. I feel like in the world of hospitality, wine, food, spirits, you kind of jump all in and you, you get to, um, you, you, you go all in, you drink and eat all day long. And so <laughs> it's a very hands-on experience. Very hands-on. Yeah. I mean, because if I would have went and learned the chemistry of how to do it, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. So um, I think I just kept the right work. Um, and stay focused on the um, what I was passionate about. Awesome. Dr. Herbert, uh, you mentioned that uh, if anybody had told you you're going to be a hospital administrator, that you, you know, but earlier on in your career or as you're studying all those things, what, you know, what paths did, you know, in terms of what wish you have known like, or paid attention to in your education as you moved up in your career and then moved into those processes as well? Yeah, well, there are, when people ask me how I got to my position, they say, well, did you do a master's in business administration or have you gotten this special training? I, I guess it's realizing that I had a lot of experiences and opportunities that help inform how I do my job. And there are very few physicians who are hospital administrators, maybe in a chief medical officer role, but not the president. And I draw on a lot of experiences I had running my own business as a private practice, uh, serving in an academic institution uh, as, as a financial officer, um, serving on a system of a, a health system board and learning about the bigger picture of healthcare uh, business. And so it's 
really recognizing that, hey, somebody saw something in me when they offered me the job. How can I draw on all the experiences I've had that I may not have known what they were going to be good for? I mean, at PUC, I took business law and my advisor thought I was nuts. But, you know, it's come back to help me in my current role. So I think it's a, you know, for those who are listening to our conversation, it's being aware of what am I learning now that might benefit me that I'm not anticipating that, but you can really draw on your experiences to, to help you uh, as you get new and unexpected roles. Yeah. Uh, and Dr. Cushman, um, education has, was, you know, like many industries kind of given a 180 with having to be virtual and, and really not having that holistic connection with students. Um, was there anything earlier on in your career that really like, kind of gave you the tools to navigate that or to uh, be part of that, you know, the, the reinvention of those industries as well, or anything that you wish you would have had kind of in hindsight, you know, with, for that? Well, I think it's safe to say, Joaquin, that none of us were prepared for the no. <laughs> in March of 2020. Yeah. Um, but as I thought about you know, my career looking back, I think the one of the things that I benefited from was having wonderful mentors. And so that at each point in my career, as I moved from one position to the other, I took advantage of those opportunities to learn from people who were in leadership roles and potential member mentors for me uh, and choose those things that worked that I liked, um, things that didn't work that I decided I didn't want to follow moving forward as I developed my career. And, you know, I think moving along each stage prepared me for the next one. So while I never expected to be a college president, um, being a vice president in academic administration prepared me for this position. Um, but I think what happens is you move from one of those positions to another, the, the expectations and responsibilities often increase exponentially. So when I was an academic department chair, I served on several academic administration committees. I thought I had a pretty good handle on academic administration, but after being in that office for a few weeks, I realized there was still a lot under the surface that I had not um, recognized or realized. And the same moving from academic administration to the college presidency. Um, each time you move up, you have a much bigger picture of the whole organization and all of the, um, if you wanna do a SWOT analysis, you realize that there are just many more levels and layers to everything that you're doing. It's kind of like playing chess on three levels. So thinking back to the pandemic, I think my prior experiences um, prepared me for moving quickly and pivoting quickly to, uh, to what we all ended up doing, uh, offering all of our classes online. Um, it was a challenge not only for our faculty and staff, but also for our students. And I think we've all learned through this process. And at each step along the way, we take it calmly and consistently. And uh, we want to move forward with optimism and courage. And I think our campus has benefited. And certainly our students have demonstrated that. And our faculty and staff have been amazing. So um, we really are grateful for how they responded. Definitely, definitely. Um, Amy, having uh, been able to work side by side with you, I know firsthand seeing you understanding that social media is constantly changing and your ability to adapt to that is constantly, you know, growing and learning and, and, and really coming back strong with those efforts. Is there anything that you wish you would have known earlier on or any training or skills or any, any, anything really um, that really has helped you or wish, you know, would have helped you now? I think the biggest thing, and I, I just had this conversation today with my team, is about taking risks. I'm a big believer in taking risks and being true to yourself, as cliche as that sounds. And I've seen that throughout my entire career, whether it was in television and having to be told how to look a certain way, and I never followed it. I was always myself, you know, anchoring the news with very long hair, which now that's a thing, right? That's a trend. And I, I like to feel like I was ahead of that curve in terms of the chamber. Once again, it's taking risks. It's taking risks with, with the marketing plan for St. Helena to be different than the other towns, right? To stand out. Um, it's, it's trying to do something different. We just saw this at Joaquin, as you know, you know, talking with um, 
you know, everyone in the Valley about marketing efforts and things that we're doing and, and, and being one of the first towns on TikTok, right? Before, and a, a lot of people going, oh, St. Helena's on TikTok. And now everyone's getting on TikTok. So I think it's being ahead of the trends and trying something and it might not work every time. It might be a flop, um, but at least you're ahead of it and you're active in it and you have your hands in everything. And um, I, I believe risks pay off, not always, but they do. That's so true. Um, and given, so for everybody, given your perspective industries, because we have a plethora of industries on our panel today, which I find very exciting um, in the organizational behavior kind of realm, that's where I geek out on, um, and overcoming the last just over a year, but also the three years with fires and certain tragedies and, and the rallying that Napa Valley always does and always comes back together. How has innovation and reinvention played a pivotal role in bouncing back or overcoming for your particular industry? Or maybe, you know, something that caused a need for re reinvention um, that, you know, that your industry wants to keep and it's growing and is adapting to that and it's part of the new norm. Um, you know, for an example, I, I, I can see that, you know, virtual wine tasting became such a huge part of the pandemic and that's you know, and people are enjoying that still, even as we're opening up and, and it's made it easier for corporate parties that are across the U S different things. So for your perspective industries, is there, you know, what has been that reinvention piece, um, for, for you that, you know, has been positive or frustrating even, uh, and let's start, um, you know, I'm gonna start with Marcus. I gave the wine example. <laughs> well, uh, you know, during this whole time, I mean, everything that everyone was saying is, I think that's what leadership is, being able to pivot. And that was the buzzword of 2020. And what I loved about it as an entrepreneurial spirit is that it would allow the whole property to be entrepreneurs in the making because there was no rules and you got to see some of the best work with no judgment happen because they were all equally dealing with it at the same in real time. I uh, had confidence in the Valley as an industry because not only with the fires, I remember in 2014 with the earthquake and that was one of our first like major hit to our Valley with national negativity of an earthquake. And the way that the community bounced back to help each other, even though we didn't know what the damage would be or what was, um, they all stepped in. And so then after that, the 17 fires, it, I felt that we were playing off of the 14 because we already knew what to do. And then the, the 19, 20 fires and then the pandemic. So the industry, we're very lucky to have such a community that works together to you know, rise each other up, and um, and I always talk about the vintners associations and things like that. That really, um, really set the tone to have our backs as little players of the valley and and make us do the right work and stay positive. And so that um, gave us the courage and like to really just go out there and try new things. Um, it was very, innovation um, was ready to be broken in the wine industry. I and mean, there were a bunch of farmers that normally no, don't need to change how we do things, but this really allowed us to move forward. Yeah, so true. Dr. Cushman, I'm gonna pose the same question to you. I think for us, um, between the fire evacuations and the pandemic, the one thing that we took away from it that we want to keep doing as the pandemic begins to unwind is to make education more accessible to our students, whether they're here in Anglin on Howe Mountain or whether they're elsewhere. So our goal, one of our goals moving forward is to make education more accessible, probably virtually, but also via some satellite opportunities um, to reach out to those communities where our students reside. And, take education to them instead of expecting them all to come here uh, to Anglin for an education. Amy, um, in terms of the different, you know, 
I, I think the chamber does work with almost every industry really. Um, and, and, you know, in that, in that world, it made the chambers so relevant in the stronghold of needing to support all the different industries at the same time. Um, so how would you apply that question to, you know, the work of the chamber? I think the biggest thing that we saw was collaboration and I can't stress that enough. That's amongst all the chambers, the cities, the county, um, along with um, different businesses working together to cross promote one another. That was really interesting to see, you know, also seeing businesses who were sort of um, respectfully stuck in their ways, but um, branching out once again, taking risks, teaming up with their next door neighbor to come up with a creative way to try to get some people in the door or, or actually even pushing the limit even further and getting some of these businesses who didn't have an online presence to go online. Um, so that was really neat. And um, it was really neat in terms of the collaboration piece um, seeing everybody working together, you know, that St. Helena, that hashtag, you know, stronger together, right? We really felt that, you know, you, you saw wineries who had limited capacity and were full, and then they would call their, their, you know, winery neighbor and say, hey, we have somebody, can we send them your way? Mm -hmm. Little things like that, I think is really, really great to see um, the city of St. Helena, all the businesses working together to overall be a stronger community. That was really, really nice to see. Yeah, and many times in, in so many realms and worlds and industries, leadership is about collaboration and understanding that collaborating, collaboration is sometimes necessary for you know, everyone to survive. Um, Dr. Herber, I know um, the healthcare realm was very uh, hit hard, you know, emotionally, physically, organizationally by the pandemic as well like again like many industries but I think there was a struggle too for you guys not to also couldn't close couldn't couldn't you know it had to be there 100 percent 100 percent of the time um so how would you know this question apply to to the healthcare, but also St. Helena Hospital in particular yeah well when you're in a healthcare, when you're in a pandemic you'd say a hospital is absolutely essential and that's true people who were sick uh, would come to the hospital for care, but many people were afraid to come to the hospital because they still needed care. They had things that should be cared for, but they were so afraid of catching this sickness, which was very scary as you think back uh, a year ago and we weren't sure how this was gonna go. I'm, I'm really uh, very proud of our community because we never had the surges that some other communities did we, we followed the guidance, we were very careful. Um, so this community and, and when vaccine became available, we rallied together and I think we probably have a higher vaccination rate in, at least in the upper Napa Valley than most communities across the nation. So I'm proud of our community, but there was an a, a interesting situation where we're providing healthcare and people need it, but they're scared to come in and get it because they might get sick by coming to the hospital. So I think the uh, innovation isn't always applying technology. It's thinking differently about how you do your core business. And I think how we learn to care for patients at a distance using a variety of technology platforms, but it was caring for somebody who's in their home where they feel safer and you're still able to uh, get them the help they need um, and, and that's changing our industry. That's changing my practice forever. Just last Friday, I had a patient helicoptered in from uh, Marysville, Yuba City, because they couldn't find somebody to treat a hand injury in Sacramento and Chico. So I cared for this person. I interacted with him virtually on Tuesday for his first dressing change. Um, I, I used technology to get a prescription for him to his pharmacy in Gridley in 30 seconds. These are things that I wouldn't have done a year ago. And I think that'll be with us. And it's making care more accessible and more convenient for patients, which is a very good thing. Yeah. I'm going to ask another question based on some of like, this conversation. I'm going to throw something at you. Not many hospitals also had to deal with 
evacuating a hospital in times of a pandemic as well, which you guys had to do this past um, October. How would you say, you know, the conversation around community efforts and still being there for community and the, the peace of mind that you guys had to provide to the community and, and your patients as you're having to manage both? Well, that's an excellent question, Joaquin. <laughs> um, so, you know, my philosophy was if we're denied doing things a certain way, how can we reconstruct this? So, so I have the privilege of leading a series of clinics from um, Calistoga all the way to Napa. And we just innovated and we got our doctors off the campus and into other clinics. We re um, we kind of reconstituted our uh, treatment center for cancer patients down in St. Lena in one of our other offices and got the California Department of Public Health to uh, prove that so we could provide care there. So we just, we just reinvented how we were providing care. We weren't going to let evacuation and fire damage and lack of utilities on, on the side of the hill stop us. And we had our mobile health unit and we've been yeah. out the whole pandemic testing people for COVID, giving vaccination. And so when you're committed to your community, you just don't let things stop you. You just get your talented team together and you figure out how to get it done the best way you can. And I think that was surely evident um, to the whole community, which was great. Um, as we talk, continue to talk about innovation and motiv motivation, um, especially when it comes to leadership, um, and as we're, we talk about facing adversity as well, there's so many times that we all kind of sometimes feel that uh, fight or flight model. Um, so when, when you're faced with adversity, do you uh, protect what you have or do you seek out new growth opportunities, um, especially when it comes to business and entrepreneurship? So I'm going to really kind of focus this question towards Marcus. You know, how do you, how do you face that with those two options? The two options of what exactly? Uh, of, you know, do you protect what you have or do you seek out new growth opportunities when you're in, in the face of adversity? I uh, definitely seek out new growth opportunities because when you're in it, you normally don't have the ability to really work on it. And so when uh, a situation such as we went through, it was allowed us to really see what the right work the property was doing and the people if they were doing the right work and it really was a an opportunity to check in at a, a real level because we have the opportunity to either stay the direction or go a di different direction and kind of like in the beginning like finding out what their special skills were because they could offer so much more um if you ask the right questions or if you motivate them or they feel like they're going to be heard and being able to activate their um their, their, their ideas. So I definitely uh, uh, go towards uh, innovation and growth whenever I have the opportunity with, Amy, a, without a pandemic. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, I'm going to pose that same question to you because, um, you know, like, like Marcus just mentioned pandemic or no pandemic, there's always different things happening in business and different challenges and different, you know, kind of, technology needs or even you know visitor needs whatever that looks like so how would that you know question be posed to you and in, in your your work history or in your work but also in terms of conversations you've had with other business owners yeah well i've had a lot of business owners say well if it's not broke why try to fix something and it's like well if you're not reinventing the wheel the wheel's not spinning and the wheel's not moving up and up and up so you can view it from two different perspectives I always like to seek out growth. And sometimes when you're seeking out growth, um, you might feel like you're not growing. You might feel like maybe you took a step back, but that's actually your growth, right? It's trying something new and maybe it didn't stick, but, but that will lead you to try something else that will stick. So um, once again, I, I believe in, in trying different things and not being in sort of a, a vicious routine and cycle because, um, you're not going to evolve or see um, the beauty of something new elaborating and almost falling into your lap, maybe something that was unplanned. Yeah, so much. Okay. Um, when it comes to 
again, something like the pandemic where we may not see an employee for months in some industries. Um, as a leader, and I'm gonna pose this question to everyone too, and we'll start with Dr. Cushman. Um, as a leader in your perspective field, what do you do as a leader to motivate or keep your team motivated when they're emotionally, physically, and even sometimes Zoom technology exhausted? That's a great question, Joaquin. And I think, you know, as leaders, we all recognize that our organizations look, look up to us for models of what to expect or how to respond to certain situations. So I think particularly during the pandemic and during the fire evacuations, you know, our organizations and our communities needed to see our leaders behaving responsibly and calmly and consistently and responding to that adversity and reassuring them with optimism that things were gonna be okay and we'd be back up and running. Uh, and in the meantime, we do our best to take advantage of the opportunities that come along. So one of the things, <clears throat> excuse me, that we were able to do here at PUC by way of innovation was uh, as clinical sites for our nursing students closed down due to the pandemic, um, we were blessed and grateful to work with the San Lino Hospital Foundation uh, through Dr. Herber's leadership and support uh, in providing clinical opportunities for our nursing students to give vaccines down in St. Helena and participate with that effort. And uh, I was grateful for the opportunity to receive a vaccine shot from one of our nursing students. And, and what a great you know, experience for both of us because they got to see the leader of the institution uh, modeling the, the appropriate response, should we get a vaccine or not? And there's still those that believe we shouldn't. So I think as leaders, we're expected to model the responses that we wish for our organizations to follow. Very much so. Um, Dr. Herber, same question. I found that uh, the, the team really needs to um, see the, the confidence of the leader and they need communication. So while we were evacuated during the pandemic, I was at the hospital every day, rounding on the units, interacting with staff and reassuring them. They, they want somebody to tell them things are gonna be okay. Um, you know, it's the one theme that's run through our community for some years now is the fires that have come near and some nearer as well as a pandemic. I mean, these all have the common theme of it's scary. And that's when those we lead really need communication. They need factual things. They need to know that efforts are being taken to ensure their safety. Uh, I remember uh, in, boy, they all ran together, but 2017, when the fires were a little further away from the hospital, but you could see smoke. And the staff who were there working were freaking out and to get factual information and reassure them and say, we're not in any danger. And then we all got back to caring for our patients. So I think the leader needs to be that, um, that person who encourages everybody and constantly communicating. Factual yeah. communication, it really, it really helps um, people relax and, and feel more confident. True. Uh, Amy, I'm going to post that question to you now. Well, Joaquin, as you know, something I brought up a lot to the chamber team is I really love the philosophy of being a leader without a title. I, somebody said that to me once and it really struck because a lot of leaders have titles and they use that to instill the way they lead their team. Whereas I try to forget that title and put myself um, somewhat as an equal with the team, but still leading the team. Um, and I think that's really important because it shows confidence. It shows strength in leadership. It, it shows um, valuing your team and really making that known that you value um, every team member no matter the title of even the team members, that they all have value and they all bring something special and unique to the table. Um, so that's what I would say about that, as a lead, being a leader without a title. Marcus. Yeah, no, this is so great because everything that I'm hearing is exactly what goes through your mind. So it's, it's really um, comforting to be amongst, to you know that you're on the right page. Um, something that with our 
property was um, unique because we're in that, that the hospitality space was I knew that we had to keep our uh, business operating. So we are essential business with winemakers and we were going through um, with the fires and, and the pandemic with the, the virus that are, we couldn't not, we couldn't make wine from home. And so, and then with the restaurant, I didn't want to shut down the restaurant, the bakery, because the wine makers relied on that coffee in the morning. And there was just, just this orbit of economy, of ecosystem that was going on. But then also with the purveyors of getting the food up, and it was, I, I didn't want to break that cycle because I did, was afraid to what it would be like to restart it. And when I found out that during that time, as we were feeding, I don't even know how many families every Tuesday through the Boys and Girls Club, and then every week we would feed our, uh, our team members. And then we went and did the hotels. But what I, I realized was that once we put the, gave the autonomy to our department heads and our, 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 our team that might've been fearful of losing their jobs or getting food on the table, they got the power to take that food and share it with their neighbor. And it put them in the position to feel that power of helping someone else and learn how that with the communication that Dr. Herbert talked or Steve, uh, uh, Dr. talks about that communication that was so powerful and they were doing it in their real time in their home. So I would give the food to the need of our team because they weren't working, but they didn't really need the food, but they took the food and gave it to someone that needed it. And I really love that it was that kind of feeling that they were able to understand like the big picture. And I feel all of us are going to go through this again right now because um, as with the mass um, conversation and how are we explaining it to our team that like Dr. Cushman was saying, like are afraid of the vaccine or don't believe in it or, or want to do it. And then now with the mask that you don't have to wear it indoors or outdoors, but some business still will require it to you. How do you gently communicate that to your team? Then the team communicates that to the guests. So it is going to take a strong leadership to really understand how are we that next uh, that next dilemma out. Yeah, that's so great because what came to mind as everybody was talking right now was with hospitality, with education, with healthcare. Um, it's all about you know. There's such a strong connection to servant leadership. And the way we serve one another and we connect with one another, one, one other, um, and how much we come sometimes take on energy wise as leaders too. Um, and, and why I, I tell my team at Blue Zone, say, take care of your energy. And that's part of the culture that we're building within there. To, whatever that energy looks like at the moment, take care of it. Um, and so with that though, in terms of dealing with stress as leaders and being resilient, um, you know, as a resilient leader, how, how do I show up in times of stress? What are maybe some, you know, tactics that you guys have or, you know, key, key things to do or how do you deal with stress outside of it even, you know, before you go to work? Um, uh, and then let's start with Marcus because he's like, he, he knows exactly well, what I'm talking about. It's <laughs> funny because we, like when I was listening to the bios and everyone, you know, you have to go to school to be a doctor. You don't have to go to school to do what I do, but I did go to school. I did was started in San Luis Obispo and um, ended up getting a degree at Sac State, but my degree was in leisureology and it's a study of leisure. And I had a professors, Dr. Strandra and Dr. Olson that were leisureologists. And I guarantee you at the time, I had no idea why I was taking these classes, but they were one of the most fun, easiest classes to get through. And it was stress management, it leisure, leisureology. And I remember sitting in the first lecture and having all these different cultures in the room. And culturally, leisure is different to everyone. And when I saw the uh, people defining what leisure was to them, leisure was studying to some cultures, leisure was working, <laughs> where another culture would be like, leisure is 
sitting on the river and watching, you know, the rapids uh, go by. And so I took every leisure class that Sac State offered. I got my degree in leisureology. I actually became a TA and I was like, I'm not leaving this. My parents always said, do what comes easy. And I finally found it. So when this whole stress thing starts to happen, I kind of just go back into like that leisureology uh, space of going, okay, you know, um, let's work on the problem that in it, basically. So uh, if you put leisure in your day-to-day, -day, I think you will have ability to handle stress at any level, I think. <laughs> Um, and, Dr. Um, yeah, oh, go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. No, it's just uh, okay. And then maybe some wine. That also. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Herbert, I know stress is a conversation a lot in healthcare, and and but not just for people who work in healthcare, but also patients and the entire community. Um, so, how would you kind of frame that that question for you? Well, first thing I'm going to do is go back to school and take that degree that Marcus has. That's, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Uh, but you know, when you're, when you're in a leadership position and you feel responsible for other people, there's a tendency to try to do more. And, and, um, and that's a trap you can fall into where you're not taking care of yourself and then you're less effective in your role. So the one thing that I would, um, you know, say in response to your question is don't forget to deal with this yourself. And all of us have different ways of having some downtime, being in the moment, reflection, meditation. I ride my bike on Old Hell Mountain. Don't tell the county because I'm not supposed to be up there. But, um, you know, it, there's no cars. You can think about things. So taking time for yourself so you're, you're the best version of yourself you can be so you're available for others. And, and I have a wonderful team member who is my conscience. And regularly, at least twice a week, she stops me and says, she looks me in the eye, makes me stop whatever I'm doing and asks if I'm taking care of myself and, and doing things about the stress. And it's just great to have that reminder. But I think we owe it to those we work with to be there for them, but we have to take care of ourselves first. I'm going to move along to some of the other questions as well, because I just noticed we're we're getting there. Um, so Amy, I'm going to pose this question to you because I think you see a lot of this at a high level. Um, and, and in many ways, the chamber leads this, these, these efforts, but uh, working in the Valley and just knowing that Napa Valley and what Napa Valley is, collaboration is very key. So how can businesses and organizations be resilient and innovative together um, and maybe, you know, what are some examples you've seen or maybe some like very inspiring examples that you've seen as well? I think it goes back to the collaboration piece. Um, you know, we always talk about, right, if we have a lot of foot traffic in St. Helena, that's great for Yauntville and that's great for Calistoga, right? And so it's, I think it's working together and, and really being a team with our surrounding businesses. Um, marketing is key. So you know, we've seen a, a lot of businesses collaborate maybe with an influencer, right? And, and that influencer comes and then businesses team up and they cross promote. And it's a great way to, you know, still reap the, the benefits, but maybe you're not having to pay for everything out of your pocket, right? Especially during a hard time. So I, I think it's working together as a team and, and um, you know, thinking outside the box and, and trying to, to really see growth that way. Yeah. Um, Dr. Cushman, how would you kind of pose that question in terms of, you know, how has either the education community really worked with other businesses or organizations or, you know, tech companies even to really kind of be resilient and innovative together? One of the ways that, that we can do that particularly is by creating internship opportunities for our students in some of the Valley organizations, businesses, et cetera. 
Um, we partnered with Napa Valley College in terms of providing articulation agreements so that their students can transfer into four-year degree programs here at PUC. Um, but I think probably most special, and I'll hark back to what I mentioned earlier, has been the opportunity to partner with St. Helena Hospital Foundation and serving the community and providing uh, uh, food uh, and water uh, immediately after the fire evacuation and people were able to return to uh, Angwin in particular and Howe Mountain in general, uh, but then also the opportunity to participate in the vaccination effort. So I'm grateful for those kind of uh, collaborative opportunities and look forward to more of those as we move forward uh, as the pandemic slows down. Uh, in the yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, as we open back up, you know, or we, we try to understand what opening back up looks like after this pandemic um, and, and how rapidly or how slowly this may look to, to various groups. Um, Dr. Herb, I'm gonna pose this question to you um, and then to Marcus. Uh, what do you think the biggest challenges are to innovation and resilience right now? Um, or kind of what, what, what does that look like in terms of opening back up and how can we overcome them? Well, I've just been encouraged by listening to the other panelists um, today. You know, I, I think the biggest challenge is not um, not being bold enough, not looking outside the box and having the courage to try new things. And it's a time when you might feel like, well, resources are a little tight. We're recovering from, you know, this downturn. We got to get out of this, but it's not a time to be cautious. I think it's, you know, Marcus has really encouraged me, man. I'm going <laughs> to try some new things and, uh, I'm not going to go into hospitality. We're not quite that. <laughs> <laughs> But, but and I, I can't go into surgery. <laughs> okay, that's it's a deal. Yeah, but we got to try new things and and, um, and and try to do some things differently. See see things differently as a result of what we've been through. Yeah. Marcus. Yeah, you know it's it's I always try not to hide my um, oh I try to hide my enthusiasm when things get rough and I get really excited because I see the opportunity of really going, okay, you know, this is what we were, what we're here for. And one of the things that I really jumped into was wanting to not knowing what the outcome was going to be now that we're living in and really taking the brand and refreshing it, taking that year so that when we did reopen up to the community, that we looked refreshed, not only in our appearance, but then in our messaging and our branding and our products that we were sending people home with, um, the quality of, of it to really say that we didn't just sit at home and wait for us to reopen to start over again. We did things that we normally wouldn't be doing. The resources were a big thing, but I was like, I want to, you know, refresh our brand, even though we're only six years old, I wanted to have a, a marketing um, co cohesive from our winery to our bakery, to our restaurant, to our tasting rooms, to our vineyards, to the gallery, to our mercantile. So they all cohesively were on the same page. And so I truly uh, had used these times to take those to, I, I never use I risks or wherever take those times where normally you wouldn't have the opportunity to really focus on those that kind of work and uh, not to go too winded I kind of do that every three or four years I act like I retake over the company that I'm in and I'm like what would I do and I do it because normally you're like oh but you know you think of the past and I'm like no this is we're taking it over and what's going to happen now and that's how I've been able to move things forward is by not thinking of the past and just really saying, this is what we need to do next. Yeah, yeah. Okay, last question for everyone as we get close to time. Um, what is one thing that you would like to see for the future of your industry, your field, your work um, in the Napa Valley? Uh, and let's start with Dr. Cushman. Thank you, Joaquin. You know, I think as I mentioned early on in this, 
panel discussion, um, our efforts to make education more accessible uh, is probably one of the things that I would see as an opportunity, a growth opportunity, and really a, an opportunity to better serve the Napa Valley community and those in our region. Yeah. Amy. <laughs> this is a loaded question for me. <laughs> But I would like to see um, change accepted um, in terms of that destination marketing piece for the city of St. Helena, a little bit more growth, but still staying true to our roots and being respectful of our community. But um, I, I think it's, you know, seeing where technology, seeing where the world is evolving, and it doesn't mean you have to 100% be in alignment, but at least seeing those um, changes and embracing them and maybe coming up with our own path that works for the city. Uh, Dr. Herbert. Well, as you know, I'm passionate about our community being healthier and I'm excited about our partnership with the Blue Zones Project so that people are enjoying a, a even better quality of life. We live in a wonderful place, but to enjoy uh, great health and to have our hospital be the partner in that when you need some little getting back on that healthy path. I, I look forward to, to having uh, access to the care people need so they there's never a time they have to leave the valley for, for care. And maybe they need less care because they're healthier. That, that's my vision. Um, and that, last but not least, Marcus. Yeah, well, this is a, a big question for Napa Valley, but I would love for, you know, we say we live in a bubble. I would love to be able to take Napa Valley, how we've been doing it virtually, like you, uh, the virtual tastings, but really bring Napa Valley to people's living rooms and somehow for them to know how to live the lifestyle and the healthy lifestyle, and then also have that in their community so that they can actually entertain at a Napa Valley level. One of the things that I always say to our team on the property is that we got here for a reason. And unless we're living the lifestyle in Napa Valley, there's no way we can show the guests that visit us what that means and they can feel it. So if our industry can continue to take Napa Valley on the road and really show people what we do here. That would be awesome. So true. Well, I wanna thank each and every one of you for being on this panel. Um, thank you to PUC and the chamber for allowing me to moderate their, their great collaboration on this. Um, any, any last words from anyone before we close out? I'm just so thankful to thank you, Dr. Cushman and Dr. Hooper. Um, I'm, I love listening to what you guys have to say. And <laughs> it's kind of cool because I'm always talking wine and food and I was like, and healthcare, I'm such passionate about keeping people healthy, even though we eat and drink a lot. But um, I feel like there's a combination and moderation. So thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody again. Um, and thank you to the chamber and PUC for, for their collaboration on this project. and. Um, this is our last one of this series. Um, I'm looking forward to many more conversations. Thank you. Yes, and the chamber is so grateful to collaborate with PUC. What a, what a great series. So thank you so much, everyone. Cheers.